Hi, this is Jeff Woods, uh, ADB Jester on Flickr and on Facebook, and I've had several of my Facebook friends ask me what goes into making a picture like this. I post these pictures frequently. I've taken them with uh, telescopes and cameras, um, and people want to know, is this really what I would see if I could see that? And the answer to a certain extent is no. There's an awful lot of artistic license taken here. Uh, these objects are way too dim to ever see with the human eye. Um, you'd look right through them. Um, what happens is the camera the, the camera that you use to shoot daytime pictures uh, can capture everything in the fraction of a second and uh, you get a high dynamic range, you get all the darks and the lights and the shadows um, it doesn't happen that way with astro cameras. Now, your Canon or Nikon that you use for daytime photos um, has a checkered grid in here. It's called a buyer matrix, and uh, some of the pixels are green, blue, and red. They're sensitive to red, green, and blue. And the picture that comes out looks like this, and math is used to turn it into a picture like this, but that loses signal. Now, we don't want that in our astrophotos. So instead we shoot with a black and white camera with a red filter over the front to capture the red light with a green filter and then a blue filter. And then we also use a couple of specialized narrow filters to capture specific elements uh, emission lines. Uh, hydrogen alpha is detecting a very deep red that uh, is emitted when um, when electrons change uh, orbiting shells in a hydrogen atom. And we also get a blue-green turquoise from oxygen-3 emissions. And my headphones are falling off there. So, what does the data look like and what goes into acquiring the data from the camera originally? Well, to get to here, we actually start here. This is a 300 second, a five minute exposure with the blue filter. And it's pretty dim. All you can see is basically a few stars, but all of the information that was stored in that other image is in there all of the bluish of the stars and even the blue required to make the pinkish tones through here is in this image. So how do we get to here? Well, first we have to understand that the objects that we're imaging are so dim that when we take this 300 second photograph there's very little variance in the information. Um, a, a JPEG image, for example, has colors intensities varying from 0 to 255. I'll we'll take it all the way up to 255. And if you were to examine a picture, a real picture, uh, an outdoor action shot, you'd see that there's a lot of data in the darks and there's a lot of data out here. But in our shot, well over a million pixels are right up against zero and very little data is out here in the stars. So to get to that rich star field and the rich nebulosity we have to stretch this histogram so that all of this data is spread out over a much wider dynamic range. Um, and we have to make sure it's good data. So the first step is acquiring all of the pictures that you're going to use. Now here is, um, I have loaded here two different images. I'm going to blink back and forth between the two. And you can see that they are the same image. That one seems to be a little bit brighter and that one's dimmer. That one's brighter and that one's dimmer. And there's a reason for that. This is, this is the good data, and that's actually a bad image. It's way out of focus. Uh, let's show you this by zooming in. We'll show the pixels, and we're going to go right on into the center. 
And look at that little diamond of four stars. That is the bad image. Now, you see all the other stars out here? Well, let's go in even a little closer. Look how much more tightly focused, especially these little outlying stars are in the good image and the bad image. Look how much bigger they are and how much fuzzier the other stars are. So this is an image we'd want to use, and this is not. Now, I'm going to temporarily on screen stretch that histogram out. It's called Dynamic Development, Digital Development Process, DDP. And I'm going to stretch it out so we can see. See now, if, as you see, the, the histogram is starting to stretch way out. So we can see a much wider variety of intensities of gray. Nearly black, dark gray, lighter gray, white. So let's stretch that way out so we can get a good look at our images. I think that's pretty good. So that is what is actually in that original image. If I turn DDP off, that's what we started with. But when you stretch the histogram, that's the information that's inside that picture that you can pull out. Now, if you blink through it zoomed out this far, they don't look like bad pictures. But if you zoom in, this is the bad one. If you zoom in on the bad one, look how out of focus those stars are. Fuzzy blobs compared to the good one where they're just tiny little points. So we don't want to use the fuzzy one. Now we can empirically measure these with the full width half maximum. It's basically a measure of half of the intensity of the star in pixels. Um, so 2.05, this one's almost 50 percent less focused than the good one. So we won't use that one. We'll only use this one. But now, now that we've stretched that histogram, let's take another close look at this picture. Look at the graininess that you can see in there. Well, look at this. There's this strange line going through the picture. And it's not at all uniform. There's black pixels and uh, all kinds of noise in there. And that's because there's atmospheric variance. The, the camera is it's got quantum efficiency of only about 45 percent so over time you expose it long enough it's going to it's going to average out but we can't expose much longer than five minutes I mean, we can go up to 15 but it won't do us any good the way we get rid of this noise is by taking multiple images of the same data okay i've got it loading eight identical images from the red data I'm going to zoom out. Now, these are already culled. Uh, I've already gone through and measured every picture and only kept the ones where the stars were small enough and the focus was tight enough and there weren't obvious flaws in the image. To get these eight images, I probably took close to 14. And I throw away about 75% of, uh, or about three out of every eight images I throw out uh, with some sort of flaw. So now we have eight available red images, and we're going to stack them on top of one another to reduce the noise. So how do we do that? Well, let's take a closer look at the data again, just like we did before. Oh, look at all those black pixels in there. Those are bad. Now, another thing to notice is that these images are not exactly of the same thing. Those stars move around a little bit. And that's because the telescope moves slightly as it's taking the pictures, and it's in, in fact being told to do so intentionally so that any bad uh, any bad pixels are not in the same place because once we have them registered to each other and start averaging 
then the bad pixels will cancel out. We'll look at that in a little bit. But right now, one thing I notice is that this image, the stars seem a little elongated compared to that and that. So I'm not going to use that image. I'm going to remove it. And we're going to go with 7. They all look about the same. But one thing I want to show you is that our camera is not perfect. It has flaws. It has column defects. So you can see here that this column is dark. This column has a dark splotch and a white splotch. This column is bad. Um, if we were to move um, across the image, I'm sure we'd see other flaws when we're zoomed in. There's one there. Now those need to be removed before we can begin. So I'm going to close all of those and show you how we remove them. We actually do that in a DOS program. And let's see. Oh. Where are we? Okay. Now all of our images here were taken from the west side of the mount. Uh, if it, it was taken from the other side of the mount, it'd be an east side, and the picture would actually be upside down, but our programs take care of that. But it, um, the important thing is I have characterized this camera. I know what it does. I know which columns are typically bad. Um, it's not always the same. It varies from shot to shot, but I know which ones will usually be bad and always need to be fixed. And I've already created a batch file to fix everything on the west side. So we're going to run that now, and it does it. Now, do I already have a work tree? Yeah, I've already been through this once. helps if I type correctly. Now, FixFits is an interesting program. It will not rename, it will not function on files that contain the name FixFits. And all of these do. So we're going to real quick go rename all of those files. I'm going to pause and just do this. Okay, I've got a little batch utility here that will take all of the file names with fix fits and rename them. I've just told it to find and replace underscore fix fits with nothing. We'll apply and that's all we need to do and now our file names do not have fix fits in them. But that only took care of the columns we know about. There will be others that vary from shot to shot and from night to night. So we're going to find columns in monochrome in all images at a resolution of 23 and now we're just going to take the output of fix fits which is simply telling us which columns it found were bad and turn it back into a command line that will fix these columns in each of these images. I'll do this very quickly That's it. Now we have a batch file. We'll fix in monochrome the individual file with these columns. And we can fix F. And now everything that has the name fix fits in here is our column, our fixed images. So let's load those into 
our stacking program and see what we get. I'll pause while they look. Okay, here we go. Seven red images. I threw out that one that was with uh, egg-shaped stars. And we now need to stack these on top of one another. But as I noted previously, if I stacked these on top of one another, what I want to do is take that pixel in that star and average it with that pixel in that star in every other image. But these images are not in the same location. They move around. So if I average that pixel it's going to be black there and white there because it's moving. So before we can do the stacking we have to align these and line up every star in every image with every star in every other image. And the way that we do that is through a process called registration. Now before we do that we want to analyze our data to see how good it is. Well, this tells us of what I selected. The average pixel has a value of 653. The most common pixel is 622. The maximum is all the way up at the top, 65535, and that's probably right there in that star. Yep, look in the lower right corner down there. But what concerns me here is that the minimum is zero. There are some dead pixels there. Those are, and, and look, there's a star trail going, or a satellite trail. That's caused by a satellite passing through our image while we were taking it. And we'll take that out later. What I'm concerned about now are these dark pixels, the zeros. Uh, and the way we can take those out is to locate them, reject them, and then interpolate them back in based upon their neighbors. And we do that with a process of data rejection. We're going to reject a range. And ultimately, we want to see all of the dark pixels go away, but not much more. Around 1% of the image is what we want to reject here. So let's apply to all and see what we get. Well, we got 1.56 on 538, so that might be a little too much. 1.08 is good. 0.80 is good is good. Point nine five is good. Point nine oh is good. Three f uh, see now that what pixels that are rejected will turn red. And if you get too many red pixels, then interpolating them. gets to be a problem. Like that little spot right there. Uh, taking the average of the stuff around it, if the stuff around it's also rejected, it's going to leave artifacts. So we don't want to reject that much. So let's go back and you know, look at the corners. Look how red those got. That's way too much to reject. So let's reject a lot less. Let's reject 510. That's probably not even low enough now. Oh, 510 is just about right. 1%. Is 510 good for that? Close enough. Uh, 520 for that, maybe. All right. We're back to the beginning. So now let's just go ahead and tell it. Take everything we turned red and rejected and interpolate it with the data around it. And now we have far fewer completely red or completely black pixels. Now there's going to be some, but that took care of a, a great many of them. Now we need to stack these images on top of one another. So the software will do this for us automatically. It will do, it will line up all the stars. It will resize the image if it needs to be resized. It will rotate it if it needs to be rotated. And it will uh, move it if it needs to be moved so that every star is on top of every other star. So let's tell it, go ahead and align all these images. 
and there it did. All images aligned. There were 293 stars. It used 19 of them. The root mean square error is less than 0 0.4, which is good. Let's blink through all of our images. Make sure we don't have an outlier with an RMS that's terribly high. We don't. So now what we have to do is create new images. This only did this in memory. Now we have to create new images that are actually new bitmaps where all of the stars are in the same location. To do that we have to resample the image and that means introducing a little bit of a blur into the image. It's okay, it's something we have to live with. Uh, there's just no other way around it. Bicubic B-spline is a good way to uh, to resample an image without uh, very much blur. So now the one image is not going to be blurred. 205009 is our base image and it's the one that all of the others were matched up to. So all of the others will be resampled, but this one, 205009, will not. So we'll apply to all. And it's crunching numbers and picking the best pixels and smearing the pixels around a little bit to keep the, the light intensity the same, but to make sure that the stars are on top of each other as closely as can be. And when it's done, we'll zoom in and see that indeed the stars are all exactly on top of one another. And that one that's with the smallest stars, that was our base image. That was 205009. And that's okay. Now when we average, say, this pixel right here with all of the others, it's pretty much the same all the way through. So we're in good shape. Now before we can average them, maybe these were taken under different conditions, different temperatures, different lighting, different light pollution, different moonlight. Um, any number of things can make the background different. I mean look at this background here is 644. Well let's look at the look down here in the lower right and it's varying between 600, 585 and 645 for that pixel I just left. So it's not exactly the same. And the way we get out of that is to normalize our image. And to normalize means to apply weights to it. Right now all of our images are weighted exactly the same. We'll give as much credence to this image as to this one as to this one. And if we want to reject data, we want to be rejecting them on a sound statistical analysis. So before we do this, we will normalize. We will control both aspects of it. It wants to know what is typical background, what is black. Well, that's typically black. And as you can see in our histogram, it's down here in in the blacks, so that's good. And it also wants to know what is highlight? Well, our nebula down here is definitely the highlight of our image, and as you can see in the histogram, it's moved over toward the midtones, so that's very likely the correct selection. And now our weights, I appear to have selected the strongest image and everything here is going to be given a little less weight. Now I'm fine with that. Uh, these are all very close to one. What I'm looking for here is not, you know, is ensuring I don't have a 1.4 or a 0 0.6. I want them all to be fairly weighted and if, if they were not, I might decide to reject them. Uh, I might decide to keep them too if, they, if it was a good image and just poorly weighted. Uh, the statistical rejection will take care of it, so it's not always a given that if something doesn't weight properly, you'll throw it out. Now that our images are properly weighted, we can do a standard data rejection. Now this is different than what we did before where we were getting rid of the cold pixels. This is a statistical rejection. Uh, we are going to go look at this pixel in every image and there are seven of them, so we have a, a data set of seven pixels. 
And anything that is not within 2.2 .2 standard deviations of the mean of those seven pixels, we don't want to use in our average. We're, we're going to throw away the outliers so that our average is good. Now, when we do this, we're only going to be throwing away about 2% of each image, and it's not going to be the same 2% of every image. So in the end, we will, out of these seven images, probably use six pixels or more out of each one and get a far better average when we've thrown away the outliers. So let's do this. We're going to use a statistical deviation factor of 2.2 .2 standard deviations, which should throw away about the top 1% of the image. And the way we can check that, again, is to select the entire image and look at the percent rejected. Well, it's 0.31% out of that picture, 0.85 out of that, 0 0.33, 12.07. Now, the reason for that is that this was our index, our base image. So the stars are a lot smaller. The outer edges of the stars in other images are going to be black sky in this one and that's what's being rejected. That's fine. We can live with it. We have to have a base image. We might as well use it and let it reject what was not average. Uh, we'll still get good nebulosity out of it, so I'm not too worried about the outer borders of the stars. 0.3%, um, 0.41%, 0.32. So we blink through them all and ensure that we have a reasonable statistical rejection, and when we do, we apply it. So now we can combine our image with the average of every pixel. And this will create a new image here, mean calibrated. And it's going to be, be darker because I'm going to turn off auto scaling. And that, actually, that turns out to be our stacked, noise-reduced, red image with no histogram stretching. It's still stuck all down there in the bottom. Now we can turn on, we can turn on the digital development process, stretch the histogram out a little bit, and in fact that's what we're going to do, but so that is our red image. Now I'm going to temporarily Remember that it was 5903, but I'm going to give it a super stretch here. And now, if you zoom in on this, well, look at that. All those black pixels are gone. We've got really good signal. The stars are round. Uh, there's very little noise in there, and that's because we've stacked up seven of these, taken the best of each, thrown away the stuff that's outlying. We've got a great image now. So let's put that back at 5,900. I don't remember what it was, so I'm going to put it at... ...5,700. Take the pedestal out of that. All right, so that's what we're going to save as our red master image. So we're going to take this and save the data as red, I mean, oh, red, mean, calibrated, 32 bits. We're going to save it as a 32-bit floating point so we have greater resolution in the image. Now, that was just our red data. We're about 30 minutes into the process. We still have to do the same thing to the green data, to the blue data, to the oxygen-3 data, and the hydrogen alpha data. I'm not going to make you sit through every one of those. I've already stacked up everything, so take it as a given that it's done, and we're going to move on to the next phase, which is integrating all of these black and white images into color.